Boa tarde. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to this plenary closing session of the first seat, the in-person seat PDP LATAM 2022. My name is Luca Belli, and it is an honor and a pleasure not only to be here with you to moderate this session with my dear friend Lucas Zingales, Nicolas Zingales, but also to have spent these two days with you. And I think that I only received positive feedback, partially because everyone was uh, locked locked in their houses for two years, so this is the first time that we are meeting people in two years and exchange ideas and build new projects together in person. So this is very good, and I think that what was missing in the last few years is that our relationships were transactional and not relational in the last two years. And this type of event is exactly what brings back this ambition to create a community. Personally, I had 50,000 ideas talking to people in the last two days, and I saw a lot of people very excited, especially because they communicated their ideas, their projects mm, in which they are working on, the problems that they are facing, and the potential solutions, and the potential corporations. And I am very happy that the occasion of CPDP LATAM was an occasion to approach Mexican authorities with Brazilian authorities and data protection authorities from different parts of the, the world. And this is the main objective of the CPDP LATAM, is to create a uh, community in Latin America to try to come up with a high-level debate about the problems that we face in the region and not even in the region, not only in the region, but also in globally, and to come up with common solutions. And the word, the key word to me in the last two days is cooperation. I see a lot of people sharing ideas, contributing to different projects, and sharing potential solutions, and talking about how they can work together. So this is only the beginning, of course. We are going to be here every year all the sponsors and partners that you can see in the logos that you can see in the screens, we wouldn't be able to do that without the help, without the critical support and help of all of our sponsors and supporters. We have institutional support, companies, organizations, civil society organizations. This is the multi-stakeholder event. So, and I see that it is very successful and I'm very happy and I wanted to thank every one of you for the support because it, it was critical to come up with an event like this. Having said that, before I get emotional here, I will pass the floor to my colleague Nicolo Zingalis and then we can introduce our guest speakers in this cl closing uh, plenary. Thank you, Luca. Thank you not only for passing me the floor, but to make things happen here in CPDP LATAM. I know how hard you worked with us and I want to thank the team of CETES and of GV that you worked non-stop to make this happen. And the whole community actually participated very actively. It was the first time that we saw groups of so many people, so many experts in the area of privacy and data protection, and we hope to foster this dialogue, not only related to what happens in Brazil, but the idea is to bring more and more people from different countries in the region, because what we are seeing, and we were talking about that in the previous panel, that the predominant model that is used for classes and trainings here is always to look at not only GDPR and the predominant legislation that we have in the world, but 
most of them is to transfer here the the companies here we have a few data that is that is being shown in small and medium sized companies that mostly they are making transactions and they are dealing with uh, cross border issues in our own region so it's important to establish other communities and other dialogues and what we saw is that we have small and medium sized companies that are dealing with challenges in, or gray areas in topics that should be addressed by the authorities and they show a great potential in this comparison in this dialogue between among many countries besides that what we also saw especially referring to the panel yesterday about the whatsapp case the data are people of course us but it is also a source of an economic power a, a source of economic resource so there is no use in dealing with data protection in a isolated way from the discussion of consumer protection and competition co uh, protection so we had a few interesting exchange about that and the conclusion and the guidance in the end of the panel is that we need more structures more forums more people to move forward in this cooperation so the term cooperation is really important in this discussion not only to join different regions but also to communicate with other regulators because they have a lot of learnings they have a lot of experience to share with this dialogue so here today in this session we are focusing on a topic that will not fail to create discussions in the f in the, the future we are not going to exhaust the topic in today but we want to focus on the potential of data protection not only about protecting the citizens but also fostering the utilization of data because that creates a safe environment for sharing and transfer and treating of data in general so one of the major issues about artificial intelligence is how we can embed the artificial intelligence with data protection in a way that people can feel safe so we can take off these data econo economics keeping the uh, consumers safe so we have here many important speakers to approach this topic we are going to start with the Mexican Authority of Data Protection, our guest Francisco Javier Acuña Lamas. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. He is going to tell us how the Mexican Authority is seeing this issue. They published recently a, a guideline that is very pedagogical about the ethical use of data for artificial intelligence and we are curious to hear you to hear more how you reached this this point thank you very much Luca for this great capacity to attract everyone in the region and also the sentimental region of Latin America that is present here for the modern survival and that confirms the respect to private life from the personal data and the mobilization to move forward at at least in civilization terms of efficacy about the rights always defending these technological avalanche and these economic urgencies that we see in the world we have to say that we are a little bit stressed so in the case of mexico i offered the opportunity that as a mexican authority that we are 
We just uh, gathered, met in Brasilia with our Brazilian authorities of data protection. And we are here to manifest that we are totally convinced that with this invitation, this event was amazing in here in the Getulio Vargas Foundation. So these were good spaces to share new positions, new experiences, and also problems. Why not? All the authorities of data protection of the Southern Hemisphere have their own circumstances, and the Mexican is not an exception. But in order to claim that since we are an authority, we are always called by different bodies that guarantee the public policies and to enact these regulations with autonomy and quickness. And also to promote permanently and tirelessly the exercise of the rights or to, pri to a private life from the personal data. So there is not only a, a legal term, as we call a the theoretical description of college professors. We have wonderful expectations, that is to request from the government to make sure these vulnerable rights cannot be violated. So people in their houses cannot be careful with their their personal data. So the day that we have this perception, we will have demonstrated that the world has changed. I'm very emotional to be here in in the same room as Anna Bryan because she what she represents to this community. And since we have her in the United Nations, we want always to have Latin America represented in these organisms. And this has a special meaning for CPDP, LATAM, and for all your efforts. The Mexican case, although there is a democratic tradition that is totally accidented, uh, we are turning 20 years of the first transparency law. The topic came up because of transparency, and then we spent almost 10 years to actually enact this Data Protection Act that needs to have urgent modifications from the private sector and also in the public sector, that we have 800 government facilities and in the private sector also the facilities that we believe that we have 5 million individuals from uh, large companies and multinational companies and even startups. And, of course, the professional offices, all of them will be investigating and sanctioned. And we say that in that we have to build. And we have the success of a great mission. And they they, all, they always have they also had TikTok uh, case and they sponsored our international events of GPA. But about these guidelines that you referred to, Mexico Mexico was a key factor for the Ibero-American uh, network of personal data in 2009, and now only now we could disclose our guidelines to instruct and so we can be aware of pr privacy and data protection and to m make all the decisions because artificial intelligence as many people said here is simply a mandatory tool for us to live globally today this globalization is the permanent transfer and interaction of the personal data so I want to invite everyone to keep this space. The old, the, the former meetings between researchers and academic researchers of the same cause, of the same problem, they confirmed that 
they should continue all despite the pandemic and all the difficulties of the virtual uh, era we have to continue with these in-person meetings because in the coffee breaks in the hallways this is where the good ideas come about and the best practices are shared and the best formulations of public policies so we can uh, take over this common topic in our region latin american has to be remembered not only for other things as war and our heroes and legends but also to generate a partnership and a historical alliance for personal data protection so i am sure that in i that i represent here with my uh, partners here and all the national transparency institutes that we have a chapter of personal data protection so we are here to say that we are going to be summing to these invitations and we want to be present always see you soon thank you thank you very much very beautiful message we hope in fact to see that happening we hope that the cpdp can offer uh, this forum and i would like to emphasize the importance of what you mentioned about the culture of data protection because we've seen in many occasions problems of simply uh, filling a document to record adequation to, to law, adequacy to law without, in fact, understanding how these declarations, this practice should be implemented daily. Fortunately, uh, unfortunately, without this culture of data protection, we face a big risk, risk of companies not complying effectively with the law. And besides the companies, also citizens, because data protection is an area of interpersonal relations. So if you don't think about the others and the data that belong to other person and you need to take extremely care to this, we are far from reaching our goal. So thank you for your very important uh, explanation. Now I pass on the floor to Luca to introduce the next guest. I would make use of this opportunity to remind you of two important elements. Just like yesterday in the opening session, today, if you are following us here or via streaming, you have the possibility of sending questions via Slido. So you receive the QR code and you can send your questions there. So if you want, you can start making your questions. And I would like also to remind you speakers uh, present to include our Olga Cavalli that is working with us on YouTube and she's waiting for the possibility to enter the room. So right after Francisco, we'll have Rob Sherman, who is Deputy Chief Privacy Officer of Facebook at Meta. And then we'll have Samantha Oliveira, who is a data protection offer at Mercado Livre. Then 10 minutes for questions that you might ask and you may send via Slido and then we will keep up with Olga Cavalli that is the Undersecretary of Innovation in the Argentinian government. And then we'll have Julio Azevedo that is the Vice President of Invest Rio. And uh, last but not least, we'll have Carolina Rossini, who is the co-founder of the Data Sphere. So let's go. We, after this wonderful speech of Francisco, with his considerations on uh, on his work, that is exactly the topic of our se session, right? It is how to bake. Uh, privacy in inter artificial intelligence in one of the companies that is the one with the greatest impact on inter artificial intelligence and the use of artificial intelligence. So please, Rob, the floor is yours. The, 
the comments that you made and that everybody who spoke before has made about the value of this kind of a conversation. My, my job and the job of my team at Meta is really to work with the product teams across the organization on privacy and data protection and making sure we're thinking about protecting people's data up front at the early part of the product development process. And that includes thinking about the diverse needs of different parts of our community. And so an opportunity to bring together such a diverse range of stakeholders from all across Latin America and really learn from the experts has, has been just incredible. So thank you for the opportunity to be here and, and, and to everybody for the conversation. I, I thought I would spend just a couple of minutes talking about why I think that artificial intelligence is so foundational, not only to what we at Meta are going to be building, um, but also to what all of us are, are, are working on. Um, and then, it, transition a little bit to what does it look like in practice to build artificial intelligence responsibly and to build uh, data protection into, in, into artificial intelligence, particularly when we're thinking about things like the metaverse and the future um, future computing platforms that, that, that we'll all be using. Um, and then I'll close by talking a, a little bit about what I think it looks like to go from here um, into the future and, and where we can go together. Uh, so I think one, one of the things that I took away from a lot of the conversations over the course of, of the past two days has been how diverse the uses of artificial intelligence are. Um, for us at Meta, obviously, artificial intelligence is a core part of how we, a core building block for how we deliver our services. Um, your newsfeed in, in Facebook or Instagram is artificial intelligence driven, and it helps us make sure that you're getting services that are relevant to you. Um, but there are other things kind of behind the scenes that are equally important. One of those is using artificial intelligence for integrity, for making sure that we're spotting misinformation and, and, and misconduct and, and, and identifying people who are breaking the rules. Um, and to do that, we have to make a bunch, we have to process a bunch of data using algorithms. And a big part of what we think about there is how do we make sure that we're doing that in a way that keeps our community safe, that, that, that reduces the misinformation on the platform and all of these things, but also protects people's data. And so um, we're actually, um, in the next couple of weeks, we'll be releasing a paper um, that talks more about how we do this. But I think it's a good example of the fact that um, we can and should be using artificial intelligence for things like protecting our community, and we have to have data protection principles that apply as well. And we, we shouldn't think that those two things are incompatible with each other, but it does require work to think about them together. And when I think about the future, the the, the metaverse that that we've talked so much about and that we've you know that that we've renamed our company to focus on is really this idea that new technologies similar to the way that most of us grew up and we didn't have these cell phones that we walked around with everywhere, these computers in our pockets. Um, you know, it's been a huge paradigm shift that we all walk around with computers in our pockets that we can use to communicate. And I think in the same way, um, 15 years from now, we'll all be using different kinds of platforms to communicate. Um, we'll have glasses that will that will allow us to be together even when we can't physically be together. Um, and we'll be able to have a much closer connection to different parts of the world than, than, than we can have today. I think that's all really powerful. Um, and AI is a big foundational part of that, whether that's um, machine translation. So we recently just released a, a project called No Language Left Behind that uses, it's an open sourced um, library that, that help, a model, excuse me, that helps to, it helps do machine translation for 200 languages around the world. So translating from Spanish to English is very common. Um, there are a lot of languages, Urdu, for example, in other parts of the world that are less that, that are less well penetrated and less well served. And if we're going to create a metaverse that is really for everyone, we need to have the capability, not just at Meta, but in the ecosystem, for everybody to be able to translate. Um, Op the OpenAI organization has put out a, a prototype called DALI, um, which translates words into images. That's going to be really important, not only for building rich experiences for people, but also for accessibility and helping people to experience the kinds of things that they, a, a, the, the kinds of experiences that that I might take for granted if they if they access the, the the world without vision or without hearing or these kinds of things. And so I think there's a bunch of these kinds of technologies, all under the rubric of AI, that are going to be really found. Foundational. So, what does this look like in practice, and 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 how do how do how do I and my team come at this problem? Well, um, one of the things that I think has been really powerful about the conversation at this conference over the past two days has been um, thinking about the problems, but also thinking about solutions. What can we build that helps us move forward in a world that achieves the benefits that I just talked about, 
but that also make sure that we're using AI responsibly. I don't think that's a solved problem by any means, but the, the way that, that I and my team come at this problem is to take feedback from regulators and from laws and from experts around the world and try to translate that into something that we could actually build and that we could use in our products to help to help address the problem. So um, what we've done to do that, we built a, a dedicated responsible AI team. It's a team of experts um, who, are, who are focused on building technology to help us use AI responsibly across the company. And wherever possible, they're open sourcing it and making that technology available so that everyone, even if they don't work at a large company like Meta that has a bunch of AI researchers, can do it. And so I want to talk, there, there are five areas that where we focus, and I'll just spend a couple of minutes um, talking about those, the, the five pillars, and you can look on ai.facebook.com. There's a, there's a blog post that talks about this. And they'll be familiar too if you've, if seen, if you've seen either the European Commission's work around AI um, or if you've looked at the OECD's um, work on AI. I think these, these concepts will be very familiar. But I want to talk not just about the concepts, but what we can build that might help, help us chart a path forward. Um, so the first of these is, unsurprisingly for this panel, is, is privacy and security. And a lot of what we've talked about in this session, and some of my colleagues spoke earlier on today, about privacy enhancing technologies for machine learning. The ability to use things like secure multi-party computation, federated learning, um, to be able to build rich, diverse, on less biased AI models, but to do it in a way that is privacy preserving, that reduces the ability to identify individual people. Um, I think this goes back to my earlier point that we can and should expect to have high quality AI and also to have privacy protection at the same time. And that requires an investment in privacy enhancing technology, which is a core piece of the work that we're doing. The second is fairness and inclusion. Um, even if you're trying to do everything right, there's a risk that artificial intelligence and, AI and, and machine learning models learn from society. And so there might be biases that aren't intended by the people that build the systems, but that still exist. And so um, we've been working on a technology called Fairness Flow that helps any, anyone at our company, but, but also anyone who uses it outside the company, to analyze machine learning models to understand whether they have um, whether they have an unintended negative effect on some segment of the population, and if so, um, make sure that you can take steps to mitigate that and address it. Um, I think that nobody wants to have a biased model that has negative effects on the population unintentionally, but the technology um, to be able to understand that that's happening and do something about it is still, is still emerging. The third is robustness and safety, making sure that AI once, you, once you've designed it well, is actually operating in a way that is safe and effective for the people that it's used for. And so um, one of the things that we've built actually is an AI red team that uses both software and also teams of people who try to abuse the AI, who try to figure out, can this be used to cause negative outcomes for people? And if so, can we stop it before it actually um, has a negative effect on the world? And so what we've tried to do in addition to, build, to building technology that we make available broadly is to start talking more about what those techniques are and how others can leverage them um, and how we can learn together about the, about the bad outcomes. It's much better if we figure them out ourselves um, than, than people who are supposed to be the benefit, beneficiaries of the technology um, are, are, are finding them out. The fourth is transparency and control. Obviously, a, a very significant topic, and I know um, I know many of us in, in the room are working on this. Uh, we think about transparency and control um, as being not just one thing, but different things for different audiences. And so, um, I know you know organ organization researchers at, at Google and Microsoft and a lot of other organizations have been working on things like model cards to help identify for a machine learning model to help an expert understand how is this model working, what data is it in including, and we've tried to build on this with a concept called system cards that helps you understand when multiple artificial intelligence models are working together, how do they work together, and how does that constellation of AI actually affect people. And so if you're a regulator or an expert, it makes it easy for you, easier for you to understand and, ex and, and oversee the way that the AI is working. But then there's also the question of users, right? So if somebody's seeing an ad on Facebook, for example, that is an ad that we've decided to show based on the operation of AI. And making sure that people have the ability to use what we're, a feature that we call why am I seeing this. So it will explain you saw this particular ad because of this particular inference that an, that an AI model made. 
And again, um, that, that is one specific example, but I think is an illustration of uh, the kind of work that we can do to help make this technology more accessible to people and more understandable. And finally, accountability and governance. Um, one of the things that has become foundational to how we build any product um, at Meta is our privacy review process and making sure that as we're building products and services, that affect people's data, we're thinking upfront about the benefits, but also the privacy impact, and that we're mitigating those upfront. And so a big area of focus now is how to build AI fairness and AI risk assessment into that process so that as a part of making our products and services for the world, we're also thinking upfront about these questions. Um, and so across all of those, those are, those are very early pieces of work. The work is certainly not done, but our hope is to work with the ecosystem and with, with all of you to try to build those effectively. So um, I'll, I'll close by, by saying sort of where I think, the, where, where I think this, could, this work could go and where we as a community can go from here. I, I've talked a num about a number of examples of technologies that we're building at Meta that I hope will be a contribution. Um, but I think it's important to say that the future of AI, the future of the metaverse, the future of the internet can't, can't and shouldn't be built by any one organization or set of organizations. It needs to be a multi-stakeholder process and it needs to not be built from the perspective of companies. It needs to be built from the perspective of the people who will use and benefit from the technology. And we're only going to achieve that if we have holistic conversations. And so uh, earlier in this conference, we've heard about some of the ways that we're hoping to do that. Um, the Open Loop program um, in, in Mexico, which has been policy prototyping around the idea of AI governance has been, I think, really successful. And we've learned a lot um, from, the, not, from, from the regulatory interactions and expert interactions, but also the small businesses and how, um, how smaller organizations handle this. And so this is something we're hoping to, rule out, uh, to roll out also in Uruguay um, and here in Brazil as well. And so um, we'll be doing more work on that. But I think um, this idea of regulatory sandboxes and experimentation is really an important concept more broadly than that. The idea of thinking about regulatory concepts and trying them out in practice so we can understand what actually works and helps people. What are the things that don't work and, are, and, and, and just make it hard for, for people to innovate or, or build or actually are counterproductive. These are things that we don't yet know as a, as a community and as a society. And so I think working together to test some of these out, gain experience and build together um, so that we all learn together what good looks like is gonna be really important as we head into the next phase of this. So thank you very much. Really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Rob, it was very nice to see this opening in the cooperation. And I think that the key words that can summarize more appropriately these two days is not only cooperation of what's happening, but what might happen, many ideas overlapping, and we have to structure this cooperation. Meta did, did a wonderful work with Open Loop in Mexico, it was a very important initiative. And I think these are best practices that can be reproduced to other stakeholders or other representatives or other sectors, always understanding that experimenting, and as a, as a lawyer and as a law professor, I think that we should have a less arrogant posture in trusting the perfection of the law. This is only one of the only artifacts that is not tested beforehand, before being used. So this is extremely interesting. It's extremely interesting to see how this experimentation in, in other cultures as well. And luckily, I've been working with Asian cultures in, in China especially, and they have this habit of experimenting law in smaller administrations five years or ten years before becoming a national law. So these are good practices that it's, it is necessary to integrate in our way to produce regulation. Having said that, I'll pass the floor to Nico to introduce Samantha. So, our next speaker, let's take a trip from artificial intelligent development policies in general and theoretical, now we are going to 
Mercado Livre. Mercado Livre is one of the companies that has the greatest interaction with customers in Latin America. Samantha has the burden to have to deal with privacy issues. She is the DPO of the company. We asked her to show us a little bit of her work, especially related to artificial intelligence. So we are very curious, Samantha. Thank you, Nicolo. I want to start by thanking the opportunity to be here with you, with Luca and all my fellow speakers. It is a great pleasure and a huge honor to speak on behalf of Mercado Livre to share a little bit of what we are doing in our company about this topic. I have a presentation. I will cheat to present a few numbers here. Well, I think that as many people know, we are living in a world that we are surrounded by data all, all the time in products and services are surrounding us with the data uh, that we are generating from our abilities. I'm not going to dare to mention all of them, all the studies in that area, but this is the result of our globalized world. So who is Melly in this system? We have a lot of data. I brought here a little bit of our company. So we have an ecosystem comprised by two verticals, the e-commerce one, where we have many services added to e-commerce and we also have a vertical of fintech where we provide services in the paid market. This happens in 18 regions of our Latin America representing eight operations, eight new business units of our company. We have more than 31,000 employees. So Mercado Livre itself would generate a lot of data and of course with this ecosystem we impact the life of 900 million families in terms of personal data in this ecosystem generating an electronic commerce of about 500,000 people and companies making transactions in our platforms we generate in a critical year of the worldwide economy six new 6,000 new jobs uh, a month. So I want to thank my team who were part of this Latam region. So myself and Re Fred, we try to handle the best practice in this ecosystem. So I brought here two verticals. I'll give a very practical exam to each one of them. The first one in this mission of, sorry, I got lost in the slide, slides. Sorry, how can I go back? Talking about our yellow world, what we have is the production, data production. So data per seconds in terms of numbers, we have 6,000 searches per second in our platform with nine sales being concrete per second, being the fifth most accessed website in Brazil. This information is available in our website. We like it, we showed that very proudly because we have 31,000 workers supporting all this ecosystem to survive in a healthy way and respecting privacy actions. So when we look at two personal data, this data changes into 10 million sa uh, salespeople with uh, 211 million users and 34 millions of purchases. So these are personal data that we are talking about. In the yellow world, as we call our e-commerce, we have all the examples where Mercado Livre uses artificial intelligence and machine learning to provide the services that we access and use. So we have many here. I mentioned the ones that I think are more interesting. So cybersecurity, we use artificial intelligence to protect our personal data. So we have a series of uh, uses of AI in this sense. And I'll show something that we are very proud of. That is our brain protect, uh, protection program. The BPP is a program to protect the rights of industrial property like brands, patents, uh, trend marks, everything related to the intellectual and industrial property of our sellers. 
everything is safe in the platform and we can purchase products that are, uh, are not fake and we can trust. So to do so, we de developed a machine learning and artificial intelligence to detect all kinds of ads that would be irregular or would go against somehow the property uh, rights of the brands that were being announced in the platform. In this slide here, you can see a little bit of the explicability of how our engine, uh, search engine, uh, which searches for irregular ads that go against the intellectual property rights end up bringing to us as users and consumers of the service something impacting our lives. So the tool is available in all countries. We work in the 18 countries. In one account, you can have the replication of a local irregularity to all Latin America. And we have a real-time search. We have filters that I am sharing here with you. And we also have uh, a mediation in some cases. Here's another example that we bring of our transparency report showing that and we showed very proudly how our robot, our artificial intelligence worked based on the criteria that I mentioned. The transparency report is public, it's in our website, please go there because besides the BPP we have the volume of uh, exercise of rights of the holders uh, in Brazil and also in Latin America, so please go there. I'm here making my personal wed because this is a very interesting number. But going back to the BPP, we have this huge amount of ads. I won't say this number here because it's very complicated, but what I would like to call atten your attention is this 99.15%. This is the number that we present to the market that is a real number of effectiveness and efficacy of our search tool engine to detect irregular ads and within this number there's a curious fact only one percent of all the 99 percent identified were complaints of the holders of the brands those who were uh, entitled to the right of the brand however the company worked proactively in 98 percent of the cases showing the uh, efficiency ac accuracy and effectiveness of the tools in dealing with personal data related to the ads another curiosity in our transparency report is that this number is decreasing we believe it's a big number when we look to the amount of ads in the platform but Comparing to the total of ads that we have in the platform, this is very low, a very low number. And every year we have this report, every semester, so we see this trend of the number uh, dropping. And also thanks to awareness uh, campaigns and other initiatives that we do in Mercado Livre. Now I'll go back to my first slide to sh uh, share another example of, of AI in the fintech world, our yellow world. So what are the problems when we look to the sectors and the market and the national financial system as a whole? In the origin, in every 40 uh, purchases online, one is from a fraud origin. Although this number seems small, we, if we scale that, if you are good in math, you can multiply the seconds per hours and days. So this is a huge and considerable impact. We have fraud attempts in the e-commerce. So one fraud, uh, one fraud attempted every five seconds. Again, making the math, it becomes a huge number. And financial losses related to frauds and fraud attempts, it would be about three point. Uh, 3,600 reais, it seems low, but if we multiply it per hours and days, we have a financial impact that is quite huge, not only talking about the Mercado Livre. So what are the kinds of frauds associated to this scenario where our AI is there? We have fraud related to devices, um, uh, uh, 
robbery and identity robbery again, and we have the uh, bad use of personal data, which means someone is trying to be the holder of some data, uh, changing with uh, committing a crime to be passing by another one bringing prejudice uh, problems to the real holder of the data. So we know how hard it is to have uh, an account cloned. And again, uh, 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 password robbery. So when they alter the, uh, the real data of the real holder of the company, bringing a lot of problems to us. So what is our analysis here? We have to use AI to prevent um, that. And the first one is screening and monitoring about the standard behavior of the user and how we identify this, this behavior that is not standard and how to interact with the person and understand that if they are victim of fraud or they change their habits, we can change opinions and habits and so on and on. Another point that we have associated to that is the identification, so the automation of the processes so that we can, in fact, identify in a precise and safe way that that person is who they say they are. These identification processes are quite complex. They work in their origin with a lot of personal data, uh, which are sensible data. I'm talking about technologies like face recognition. This is a beneficial use. This is one of the safest words of, uh, aut uh, of authentication of the identity. And when I talk about authentication, I'm, I need to identify the person in such a way of getting in contact with the person. So it's not a double security factor here for the authentication. No, it's uh, legitimacy, so we need a contact. So as I said in the previous slide, this is a root cause of fraud, like uh, password stealing and this kind of fraud. So this is this complex mechanism that we need to apply the AI so that we are sure that the person is who they say they are. And lastly, we have the monitoring mechanisms. I brought a, a survey from Serasa, this is public, you can access that showing that the Brazilian consumers, and it is a national survey, anyway, they show that they, first of all, are worried about safety, then about their own privacy and data protection, and it all must be uh, taken into account when we talk about artificial intelligence. So there is no AI without data processing. And everything that I mentioned here, we have basically a uh, life cycle that is sustainable to be uh, for leg uh, the legitimization of data. They need characteristics to respect the laws and regulations where the AI is inserted. It must be ethical, following some principles and ethical values. This is somehow difficult, but it's not impossible. So remember that our programmers are more and more uh, capable of working on that and making ethics being implemented. And also robust, both on ethics and technical and social aspects. So yes, it's possible we can do all that. We can gather all this framework that is divided in three lines, but it's quite complex to deal in practice. And what are the benefits when we incorporate Besides the two examples, what we have is the result, the output, the identification of standards in an automated way and a scaled way. Remember our numbers. I can have a human being checking or uh, I, uh, verifying every transaction when there are thousands of transactions per second. So to gain in scale and time, uh, for analysis that is the big secret here when we talk about these numbers that I brought to you is obviously having more accuracy. Many times our eyes can uh, can make us make mistakes and the machine is more difficult, but even though we can review a decision, an automated uh, revision. I think I followed my time. Once again, thank you very much. If you are watching, thanks to the organizers, I'm here to continue the debate.
Thank you very much, Samantha. I think that it is a very good practice what you are uh, doing to publish reports about the orders in a similar way that what happens in the content business. You uh, publish the number of orders and the number of requests answered. This is a wonderful practice. I just want to ask a question to so to give you the opportunity to complete something you haven't talked about you talked about the explainability so you we know that the one of the rights that is not in the article 20 of the LGPD is the human revision what we have in the article is an automated decision but one of the frustrations that sometimes as a consumer we have is when we deal with automated systems or um, as much as sophisticated as it is, it can generate errors and mistakes. So the question is, if you follow a good practice related to the interaction with humans, when it comes to solving problems in the application of AI? Thank you, Nicola. This is a great question because I have the opportunity here to present the work of our team. Today in the LGPD, we have a team comprised of 42 professionals who respond to our data holders individually and in a customized manner. So besides answering the questions in their self-management, the customers usually want to know something more. And we have these professionals and we do answer individually them, uh, answer them individually. We try to give them the control so they can serve themselves in the best way that they that they like the best way that uh, it is forecast in, in the article 18 so they can self-manage their own data so they can receive their information instantaneously going through the validation and the authentication process of course but uh, in the from the minute that they receive this information and they want to know more details about that and then we have this team that are going to respond them individualized manner thank you Okay, now I pass the floor to Luca again. Okay, I'm starting to control the questions from Slido here. And for the interest of time here, and considering that you already asked a question in an abusive manner here as a moderator, I will suggest us to take two questions. The first one is if the protection in the data protection law that are current, are they enough to regulate artificial intelligence? And the other question is, I think it is more directed to Rob, maybe, or to Francisco, about discrimination in AI. I'm translating from English here, so many are there many laws about discrimination. They do not cover the actions of private companies, and they need evidence about the intention. So, how is this possible to apply these? line of thought to fight discrimination in artificial intelligence if we are only focusing in bias produced by companies by private companies I think we can start with these two questions and then we can continue with the next segment of the plenary session Rob would you like to start and discrimination. I mean, I think as I, I, I mentioned in my remarks, this is a really important area to think about. Um, I don't think it's a fundamentally new area um, of law, however. Um, and what I mean by that is in, in many countries, and, and the specifics look different, but in many countries we have laws that govern what kind of discrimination is permissible um, and not permissible and what are protected categories of, of data and those sorts of things. Um, and when we look at LGPD and when we look at GDPR and when we look at laws in the United States, for example, there are very specific restrictions around how data can be processed in ways that that have discriminatory impacts. So I think the, the real question is to think about how to take those concepts and what we've agreed as a society is and is not permissible 
and, and leverage them in the context of AI. And, and so the person who asked the question is right that, you know, in some cases you could build AI, AI as a tool like any other and you could build an AI system for the purpose of illegal discrimination. Um, hopefully nobody in this, in this room is, is inclined to do so. Um, but, you know, I think that would be um, handled in the same way as any other kind of discrimination. But I think that there's another question, which is, you know, what kinds of discrimination, you know, discrimination could be something positive, right? We want to show you a piece of content that is more relevant to you versus less. That might be a positive thing but there might also be be cases where the AI would make negative it would engage in negative discrimination would make judgments based on an impermissible or a protected characteristic and those are the things where we need to do some additional work um, both on the front end to do analyses of AI to make sure that we're thinking about the biases in the data that's fed into a machine learning model for example and then also on the back end to make sure that we have technology I talked about some that we're building at meta to try to identify by the output and the outcome. So whether or not you intend for your AI to be biased, um, does it have that effect? Does it have a discriminatory effect? And I think both of those things go into an assessment of whether AI is being built responsibly. And I think that what, what we'll need to do as, as, as a community and as a society in the coming years is figure out how to translate those technical questions into both best practices and also enforcement baselines. Francisco, would you like to answer the questions? The other question that might be interesting for Francisco, but also for the other panelists here, is that do you th believe that the protections in the, in, in the current legislation about data protections, are they enough to regulate artificial intelligence? Or do we need to do something extra for that? Well, I would like to add that our law, in this case, I want to say that our general law for the public sector that started in 2017, with the entering in force practically in the same year, or in, in the next year for some adaptations that they made, makes Mexico to be more regulated than the private sector. So one of the necessities to improve the legislation in the, pri in the private sector, that's one of the greatest reasons why you are inviting me here and why we have international voice here. It's because we are working on that. The chapter uh, to refine a specific abilities in order to intervene in concrete artificial intelligence issues is really not ready. Everything is ongoing. It's an ongoing work. So these forums, this pathway to find a, a, a adequacy to fit to a new regulations of European Union is to make approaches and new exercises and new experimentations. But we still don't have an equipment to guarantee that we have clear competences. Of course, we made a few uh, mock-ups, we did some simulations with the private sector, we tried to come up with best practice that can be submitted to impact assessments in order to measure, but we cannot guarantee that we can do that with uh, enough authority. In the concrete case of artificial intelligence, especially in the private sector, this is still ongoing, so we have a long way to go. I would like to add to this question, the answer is no, very clearly. Privacy is not enough to protect or to deal with all the problems of artificial intelligence. So if we think that, I like to think, and I'm going to mention that in my talk, about the complexity. If many of us here, we learned, I've been in this business for more than 20 years, but I went to, through Facebook, Telefonica, Electronica Foundation, and Batman. So we have to think about complexity. And since we went through those places, we talked about generative internet, internet layers. The same instruments can be used 
to think about in artificial intelligence. So if we think, yes, what is the value chain of artificial intelligence? Since the data, what data, how, why, when, and whose, and the same questions can be applicable to the processing, etc., and for the algorithm itself. So, for example, if you follow the work of UNESCO, the, the reporter had to leave. But Guilherme Canella is a Brazilian who is in Paris, and he did he made a wonderful work of principles of transparency to acquire artificial intelligence. So we have the issue of transparency, the privacy, ethics. We have justice today and Facebook is involved on that meta, uh, they train their engineers in terms of ethics, even about that. So the answer is very clear, no, it's not enough. One thing that I want to recommend in terms of resources, of things that you can look for, it's another organization that is called KIDP, C-A-I-D-P, it is an organization that Mark Zuckerberg has founded in the United States. Mark Rotenberg, not Zuckerberg. Mark Rotenberg is a, is a lawyer in the United States, and he fought with Meta. I know you love him. And he did that, and he is mapping with uh, a group of students from different countries, and many people from Brazil are joining. and to the legislations that are coming in terms of artificial intelligence all over the world. There is a book that is being published and it is wonderful. So I suggest you to look for it and you are going to see the legislation, these complexities of regulation of artificial intelligence. Data is only one part of that. Last comment and then we will restart with the presentations, okay? So just a tweet, okay? Well, I think that, yes, it's quite valid to debate on legislations. I would just like to make something, uh, some comment that is very punctual. When we talk about the development of AI and regulatory sandbox to confirm the origin of the data and prevent bias in a controlled environment, and another thing would be this legislation framework about the applicability of AI. So this is my tweet. Wonderful. Now. We'll continue with the presentations. Now we'll have the only online speaker, Olga Cavalli, who is the Undersecretary for Technology and Innovation in the Argentinian government. I believe she's already connected at Zoom, right? I can see here yet. Okay, now we can see her. Olga, can you hear us? Olga, your mic is off, I guess, or do you have some problem in your audio? Can you hear? Okay, now we can hear you. Now that's awful. I would like to say that the single sad element of L C PDP Latin 2022 is that you are not here in Rio with us. So welcome, Olga, please, the floor is yours. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I don't know what I have to do because I'm hearing myself. Can you hear me? Uh, I'm sorry, I can hear myself, but anyways, this is something very new. It's, uh, well, thank you very much for the invitation. You know, you can't imagine how sorry I am to be in a country that I love so much. And well, anyway, thank you very much for the invitation. Congratulations on the event. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't watch everything because I had a lot of work here, but anyways, partially I could watch. And the event is quite well planned and with a lot of comments that are very important. So I thank for the invitation and I also thank for the contribution of my colleagues from Mexico and the colleague from Meta and uh, the one we uh, we are quite impressed by the numbers of Mercado Livre that you shared. And I would like to share two thoughts. One about the panel and artificial intelligence, and I would like to comment a little bit of what's happening in Argentina on this topic. Data are the basis for the work of artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence is the ability to process that is important, a good amount of data, 
and it's necessary to accumulate all this data but in a conference uh, some time ago we discussed the value of the data and if we use them in a correct way they are quite valuable not only to economy but to companies and society in general we see some predictions and uh, what happened in the pandemic the problem is always the use that is not right of data and uh, artificial intelligence tools so we need to make data to be used in fact uh, in the proper way and initiatives should be interdisciplinary and all society should give their opinion on the use and we have a wonderful example of a dialogue space to define rules here because people who offer their data in platforms whether participating like uh, the colleague from Mercado Livre mentioned with all the interaction that we have in social media and so on they need to trust digitally they, they have to digitally trust that data there and they can understand the privacy is there and also the data sacred to being respected so when we gather these different perspectives of safety we can understand that data are being respected and safe and uh, an artificial intelligence tool can work properly with a big amount of data without necessarily being bad being positive but then we have the strategies of artificial intelligence and in Argentina we have one and sometimes we see people discussing strategies and we are reviewing that uh, currently here and I have some responsibility that on uh, my secretary and we need to have strategies and the strategy is the ability to develop data and use artificial intelligence in the adequate framework and then the companies and individuals will interact in distant ways and probably we'll have technicians to help but the framework is when we have a space to define the algorithms one thing that i personally think about the topic is that many governmental bodies they govern on privacy on one side and artificial intelligence on the other but we are always are in different spheres and we have a common perspective taking into account the ethics and the safety of the data the security of data but anyways there are many initiatives of good practices uh, to avoid black boxes to avoid algorithms and with these initiatives we have principles that concretely are changed into actions to be applied to not only the artificial intelligence but they can impact positively the whole society argentina has a lot of activities that uh, i can i won't mention now but maybe i can answer in the questions but anyway we have a commitment with artificial intelligence to use it in a more integral way in an unstable way so that all data both private and uh, public data are safe in argentina we have artificial intelligence and we understand that today we have it as part of the diagnosis of topics in the regulation but Argentina is working in a series of activities to create an ecosystem of artificial intelligence that we understand is important to promote the national economy and the develop national development. Uh, for some years, the national state is discussing artificial intelligence with the economic and social approaches and the Secretary of Strategic Affairs are in charge, uh, is in charge of doing that and also the ministry of science and technology and we see that we are working uh, on that uh, together and our under secretary is also working on a good set of good practice best practices and uh, not some time ago uh, not much time ago we had in argentina a very nice man from an argentinian center that is multidisciplinary on artificial intelligence and he developed an initiative and the idea is that if it's interdisciplinary they will bring interesting ideas that not only include the mission the technical missions but also it includes the social science missions as part of this creation i believe that for many times we uh, 
we've heard about this uh, multi-perspective, multi-stakeholders and multidisciplinary problems. So it's uh, very important to think about it. From the operational point of view, it's not that easy to make everything happen, but we need the trainings. I mean, we need the universities working on that as well, and we are working on that in events like this one that we are having here. The idea is to articulate forces from all sides, like the academy, the industry, operators, and having an ecosystem to provide the development of artificial intelligence in the country. And as I said, Argentina is a strategic element for the development of that. And Argentina believes uh, that we have an important ability in the academy uh, to develop things to be applied to this topic and also uh, on April, we announced the center that I just mentioned, and we led the Alliance of Interficial Alliance, that is a set of 25 countries that are for the development uh, of that. And we have Australia, Brazil, Canada, Jap Japan, and other countries. And this is also a landmark on the thinking of dimensions of countries who have some important development, especially in terms of ethics and education on artificial intelligence topics. Especially the center proposes to discuss on technological topics of artificial intelligence with also a social mission, focusing a lot on the production sector. We understand that AI may promote the productive development in Argentina the active participation of the public and private sectors and the uh, uh, need for the specific training is there and we have many people uh, discussing the ethics in the sense and we don't know exactly uh, but we are developing special trainings for that and we have applied investigations for companies to promote technology transfer to the productive sector which is important in the center and to ensure that it's sustainable uh, financially and long term for the countries that are being part of the center. And it's a big challenge. And also, uh, last year, in the end of last year, we had the social work with our activities of and the Secretary of Strategic Affairs, and we launched a lab of artificial intelligence in Buenos Aires. And we have a lot of professors from the one of the most important universities here. And we created a program called IALA, that is a basic training program on artificial intelligence. This is important if we want to develop the country on artificial intelligence. So we urgently need to train people and they need to carry on with their activities. So this training is pioneer in the world and we are training people specifically on artificial intelligence. And we also have the law school at the University of Buenos Aires discussing that. And finally, I would like to mention that the commitment and the strategy is to have this integral uh, framework to integrate data to the private and public sectors. And the strategy understands the problem, the problems, and also understands that some activities can be better controlled with any, but the impact to society, like for example, the impact on labor of, uh, issues, and it can go through uh, the dialogue on that. And finally, Argentina was a pioneer in defining the data protection law on year 2000, but this law that is now more than 20 years old. We are discussing how to update it and we are reviewing the normatives from based on the European Union and we hope that it is defined uh, soon. In the case of the data protection law, the regulator is the agency of access to information that is also a PDP and it is uh, representing the nation. So, well, I think I can answer your questions and thank you for the invitation for being here. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, dear Olga. I think that 
Today's talk is very interesting and important for many reasons. First, it is very good to see that there are many examples in Latin America of governments, whether it's the local level or national level, that wants to embrace technology as an opportunity for development. I think many people and many observers in Latin America in the last few years could criticize a certain delay technologically wise, not only in the adoption but the understanding the potential. And it's very good to see Argentina, I'm going to see with Julio now when we talk about Rio de Janeiro, how are we, you are betting on technology, you understanding the value of technology and the qualification on technology. So there's no use in having technology without qualified people to use it. So and it's wonderful to see that Latin America is a pioneer, a pioneer region in terms of best practices. After we have Brazil that was a pioneer in the multi-sectorial uh, benchmark in, in, in the region with TGI.com.br, so Argentina is being a pioneer to understand artificial intelligence. I think the other countries, this is the greatest resource of this CPDP LATAM to demonstrate that actually Latin America doesn't need to copy what is going on in Europe. We have a lot of things that the so-called developed countries from the global north, they can be inspired by the global south, including Latin America. So it was a very inspiring talk. Thank you very much, Olga. I will pass the floor to Julio Zevit. Now he's the vice president of Invest Rio. And it's another type of vision and another example and how other types of governments in the local level is really creating a very innovative view on how to use technology and development and innovation as a factor of development and inclusion in the local level, but also with uh, regional ambition. And I would say a global ambition, why not? So please, Julio. Thank you, Luca. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to come back to this auditorium after so many, uh, many years and so many difficulties to create these events. I had a presentation. I don't know if we will be able to show these slides. If we can't because of the time, there is no problem. Because when we started the work in Invest Rio in the third administration of Eduardo Paes, of the mayor Eduardo Paes, in January 1st of 2021, we started this work thinking about how we would make Rio to come back to, to be a Rio with the economic development, a city that would look at the global issues again, and a city that would be protagonist in, in its great, spot, great potentials. And talking to the mayor, we did a, a joke, we made a joke that let's not talk about Rio de Janeiro today with all the problems uh, going through an economic situation that is difficult because of this pandemic. That's not, of course, that is not only Rio, but if you are from Rio, you know the situation that we were before. So let's talk about today. Let's talk about the future. Let's imagine the city that already reached the goals to become a smart city, to become a thriving city, a global city, and a city that, in fact, can, had gone through an economic development, uh, social inclusion process, and a process of economic development allied with sustainability, because that has everything to do with of Rio de Janeiro. So we made a picture of the future a picture of Rio of 2030. So it was a boat and, and a, a milestone that we, we, we put. And then we came back on time to see an intermediate process, the Rio of 2024 or 2025, in a city that is still under development and until we reach 2021, where we are right now. And that was when we started. In order to reach this future city, 
the future that we desired. So from that, we developed all of our plan, of our economic plan. InvestEU has an agency to attract investment. It's totally related to the Secretary of Development, Economic Development, that also mentions innovation. So the first pillar since the beginning was technology. But it's not only technology. Technology is not enough. Rio de Janeiro has many social problems of inequality and violence. So we couldn't overlook this inclusion. So the second pillar was inclusion. So how to think about development looking at social inclusion. And the third and last inclusion, the uh, third pillar is sustainability. If we look outside the auditorium, it's obvious why we have to think about sustainability, why we have to talk to the environment, why we need to have economic development, but also respecting the environment and also transforming the environment in a greatest greatest asset and financial asset in the green economy in the economy of the future. So based on these three pillars, technology, sustainability and inclusion, we put together the economic development plan of the city. And then we started this process in January of 2021, thinking on how we would have this narrative. We needed to have an investment thesis that was very clear for the investors and for the, the Rio citizens, so people can come back to invest in Rio again. So we put together a marketing plan. The name was Invest in Rio, inviting the protagonists, that is the local residents, to invest in Rio again. So let's start this process to build new narratives in favor of the economic development of the city. When we started this process, we developed many different projects. And since the beginning, our role as uh, the administrator, we have two clear roles. We have the role to provide public services, how we can offer the best public services for the citizens. And it's impossible not to talk about data, not to talk about artificial intelligence or, or of an intelligence of a city that needs to understand where the city and the citizens are going, what problems we uh, we have to face. And later, I'm going to talk about these operation centers that start from a tragedy that we had in Rio. But from a tragedy, we transformed the city in terms of conception on how the city can deal with its problems. On the other hand, how the administration can foster technological development and economic development to attract companies. I can invite Facebook now to install an office here in Rio and uh, many other multinational and national companies and how we can develop our city, creating more opportunities for the youth and educating and graduating new programmers with new programs. Based on that, these two streams, to look at the services and to foster new services, we start this development. And specifically the operation centers in Rio, that is the main reference that we have. We won an award in the previous administration of the mayor, Eduardo Paz. It was the Smart Cities Award that was delivered in Barcelona to the mayor because the Rio Operation Center is a major reference not only to capture data that the users, the citizen, give the administration every day, but it is also a reference of how different bodies inside the city administration and the states and the federal administration can deliver a single service to, this, to the citizen. For the citizen, it doesn't matter if it is National Guard, military police, or firefighters. They don't care. They want to solve their problems. I am, I am in danger. I want someone to help me. So how we can gather the information from a citizen that is going through a dangerous situation in a floods or a landslide that is very typical here in Rio, how we can treat this information to, to verify if it is true, because sometimes the information is not true, and we can deliver this information to the relevant authorities so they can act assertively. And at the second moment, to avoid this situation can happen again. As I said before, the operation center is, is started from a tragedy that we had in Rio, a big flood that we had in Rio, and we saw the necessity to have these data treatments and this data capture so we can have a better assertive delivery to avoid these problems from happening again. So when I talk to the mayor is that the new tragedy shouldn't happen again. 
and the Rio Operation Center became an, a reference about that. And there are many private partners and public partners who integrate the actions of the administration in Rio. And from fostering a new technology that we have to, we can't set aside, that is the core business of investing in Rio, we understood that Rio had a good call for technology. We had one of the strongest academias here. We produce a lot of intelligence in the city, so we exported that to other cities as Sao Paulo and New York and many other worldwide. So how we could retain this talent here and how we could amplify the number of people, exp experts in technologies so we put together many projects about that and one of the greatest projects that was mentioned here is the web sums coming from here so the greatest technology event to rio bringing to rio was a way to show the potential of the city to the world and we have to create more experts and more knowledge and much more but we cannot look only to the experts in the topic and the greatest minds of the world. We have to look at the base. When you talked about inclusion, we need to look at the base. We needed to educate new experts, to train new experts who didn't have opportunity for many different reasons and many different circumstances that unfortunately is true in our country. So we created uh, scholarship programs called Carioca Programmers that intends to graduate 5,000 programmers coming from public low-income communities, public schools, vulnerable communities, including transgender communities and refugees, to show them new opportunities so they can follow this development. So if you want to, to become a smart city, we need to make our citizens inserted directly in these new technologies. And a third project that we worked since the beginning was the creation of an innovation district in the port sector here. That it is a, a name that is the Mara Valley. When we looked at the port region here in Rio, we realized, and many experts made this analysis worldwide, and how we could create an innovation district in a city and what characteristics this innovation district should have. So looking at the port area, we understood that the city had invested a huge amount of money on the, la the previous administration in Porto Maravilha. We had the best infrastructure of the city, a region that was extremely connected to downtown and all the regions like south and uh, west and north with access to transportation and space to have new households, new offices. So the port region showed perfect for an innovation district that needs to be dense. One of the greatest difficulties in Rio is that it was spread all over the city. We had Fundão in Ilha do Governador, IMPA in Jardim Botânico, offices in Barra or downtown. So the need to create this port district is to think about an ecosystem so that we had more flow, more exchange, more knowledge being exchanged every day and new businesses being made. So we create Maravalli and in Maravalli following the line not only of technology but also inclusion, we are creating the first graduation in IMP that is uh, IMP, that is the best mathematics institute in Brazil, the only one with a huge medal, that is the Nobel Prize of Mathematics, which will select world, uh, students from the whole world. And by the way, the students, the post-graduation students, they come from other countries and will have scholarships to the students so that they come to Rio to study the first mathematics uh, the, the first graduation on applied mathematics for technology, a course that is directed to the industry so that we can develop the best mathematic brains and technology brain. So all this work of the city is thinking about these two pillars because to us it's very clear how important it is to look at public services and deliver it more effectively. So yesterday the mayor announced the result of the selection process for the electronic tickets and for the first time, as incredible as it seems, we still had great difficulties in knowing uh, and understanding transport data in Rio and in many cities that it happens in Brazil and today we can know exactly 
how many people take the subway or take a bus or uh, which is the line they take so that we can deliver the best transportation service to the city. So as uh, uh, from some moment on, we can see clearly uh, which borough needs which line because a group of people is using transportation there and we can see that this line is too crowded and uh, it's not attending to the whole population. So this intelligence is clear and on the other side we'll foment more the development of the industry understanding that Rio as a global city needs to be connected to technology and to the big global topics without forgetting obviously the inclusion and sustainability. Thank you very much. Wonderful, Julie, wonderful to see how the city of Rio that was uh, already acknowledged as one of the smart cities that are the most impacting ones in the world are uh, Again, having this understanding on how to make good use of technology, but also understanding that uh, the city is smart if you work on regulation of smart cities. And we have this old joke saying that we have the smart city with dumb citizens. No, but it's not like this. It's the opposite. It's very nice to see that the city uh, of Rio is investing on training people and uh, so that the intelligence center of the city becomes the citizen. So this initiative is wonderful. The initiative of uh, scholarships for programming uh, training is wonderful because it's reusing Rio as a platform for technological development. We had the pre-launch of the Web Summit Rio this afternoon and it will be one of the greatest technology events in the world. So besides CPDP Latin in July, we'll also have the Web Summit Rio on May. So you have two occasions, two possibilities to come to Rio and discuss technology. Having that said, now let's hear the last speaker, please, Nico. So now let's go from the local to the global. Uh, Carolina Rossini was uh, introduced in the beginning. She is the co-founder of, of the Data Sphere Initiative. She is the director and she'll talk a little bit about the initiative to pro uh, that proposes models so that we can adopt in data governance. So Carolina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for being here at this time. I know it's late. I know I am between you and the drinks and dinner. So one of the things that is important in our area, especially in the civil society, is our welfare. So let's go stretch a little bit because I could see someone snoring in the audience. Anyways, we have a two minute video. I'm sorry, Olga, we'll lose your image for two minutes, but it, let's watch the video. Do we have the sound? Tem som? Thank you very much. 
and thank you city as a person i would like to thank edu and all the team for uh, the help uh, which made us show this video now and by the way thank you lucas the idea uh, and, and Nicholas, because our idea behind that sphere is something that you are already doing here, that is bringing people to talk in a nice and trustworthy environment. So I'd like to thank a lot for this possibility. It's always nice to be back to FGV, where I've worked as a professor for uh, more than 15 years ago. But just to convey my message briefly here so that we can make use of the rest of the night in Rio, you could see during these two days how complex it is to deal with data, how complex it is uh, to deal with privacy, artificial intelligence, and many topics that we discussed. And I think it was very nice what Olga and our colleague from Mexico mentioned, because they brought the open data issue so if you study the a data area, you see a natural progression on the discussion o about data reaching to a huge complexity. So over the last 20 years, starting with the transparency, uh, government transparency that generated open data, that generated licensee of the open data, and then we had all the normatives and the narration about data for the development so we have a huge work on the uh, sustainable development goals and a big uh, pre international pressure from uh, the international sustainable data goals and we reached privacy that is not new it's new in privacy but privacy laws are there since the 60s we started in, in germany and it's interesting to think about it and we also have the uh, commercial treaties that sometimes we don't even pay attention, but they cover privacy and cybersecurity and all that. They cover AI and trade secrets that impact also the AI and also cover Samantha's, the uh, sandboxes. The new commercial treaty from ASEAN has a provision on sandboxes. That is a work we are carrying out to propose cross-border sandboxes. And we published a report with the sponsorship of the England because we work a lot on the G7, on the cross-border sandboxes. So I can tell you more about it later on. I would just like to say that this is a lot of words, but along with that, there is a movement that is very important, that is converging that is the statistical improvements, better data for the best development of public policies. As we are in Rio, I would like to shout out people from the public defender here, because uh, the public defenders, because they have a research team working on the development of their work on statistical points, and it's a huge impact they make. They are uh, on TV uh, frequently. And it's converging and bringing this increased complexity. That's why we thought a lot about this point of complexity. So what is complexity today? I am a lawyer, so to us, words are very important. So what is data sphere? What is this set? It's only data. No, it's data. Humans, individuals, or human groups, uh, including companies and states and so on, and uh, standards and if we don't think about it all together the regulations coming from that have complicated effects and chilling effects as we say the GDPA that many of us celebrated brings a lot of nice things but they are creating uh, barriers to the educational sector or the research sectors and so on and on to understand a little bit of this complexity we did two things at that data sphere because we have three programs there we have dialogues, intelligence, and labs. In dialogues, we are having consultations and meetings in many regions. We have a dialogue that is sponsored by the German, uh, German government in Africa. We are developing one to uh, Latin America and one in Asia. The co-founder is in India and also in Europe. To understand that intelligence is making reports and ideas and research, to try and understand the solutions to intermediate and to cooperate and the trusts, these new players that are arising in this ecosystem. 
and the lab as for example the sandbox uh, with an international convention for data governance that is dis being discussed so in this work on intelligence we mapped and try to understand what are the standards, how they are talking about data governance. More than 35 principles were identified, and I'm not talking about privacy, I'm not talking about principles or best practices or standards on data governance. So you see the lack of uh, interoperability of the principles that make all this that we are discussing here be very difficult. But again, it goes to complexity and goes to the si silos that to us is very important to break the silos. Obviously, some areas have specific regulations and specific sensitivities like uh, health data, financial data, and so on. But there are many things that can be brought together. Another publication that we have is one that we mapped more than 250 organizations working in this area. And it's incredible to see this huge amount of organizations. And out of this uh, 20, uh, 250, that is the data sphere ma map, we have 50 as international organization. And it's very nice to see what international organizations like OMC and FAO uh, and FAUP, for example, is wonderful. They are extremely advanced on data governance for biodiversity and nutrition. They are teaching farmers to work on data. It's very nice. This is for us to understand this complexity and understand what's happening and the solutions. And uh, out of this, we had this idea of data sphere that is the systemic approach to that, is try to think about solutions that are human centric they are centered in the human being because in the end why do we need to collect data to generate value and the value means what to whom well we need to understand that and we heard nina i, I can't see nina here anymore but nina Renata, many people said that it's a matter of generating human value human to people to society so what is the value we want to generate so thinking about it, thinking about the elements, the components, like the human groups, the standards and data, how can we develop initiatives and public policies and works and trainings? Because data literacy is something very important today. I think we don't have digital literacy and media literacy without thinking about data literacy today. So what is the society that we want? We are talking a lot about including the individual in this data governance and including the individual in the data that will be fed to generate AI, to generate results, because AI is not the point. The point is the result of AI, so that the result is inclusive, non-discriminatory, and so on and on. So I would just like to leave this message here about the complexity so that we don't forget it. I think the point of this panel and other panels that we discussed, like the one we discussed the morning about interoperability, portability, it's quite complex, but it's very important uh, to catch this right, to uh, do everything correctly today, because otherwise, who are we leaving the values to? So thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Thank you, Carolina. In your talk, I saw a little bit of the repetition of the experience that we learned in the cyberspace and this complexity in the, the four forces of regulation of the individuals, that is the market, the, the standards and the, stand, the social standards, the code, and the uh, law standards and I think it has a role for the discussion of it is implicit on your technology in your well, what you said but technology and market what can the technology and the market can do to make sure the value of the data is unlocked for everyone so I think it is very important to this initiative and this is something that we can look as an inspiration to develop uh, alternative governance models other also in the global south in Latin America. 
Having said that, we can pass to the final questions. Two question stops and there are many questions here of course but one of them was asked by Natalia Couto artificial intelligence and data is are topics that have common points to authorize a joint legislation by a unique regulator agency this is the question mark I don't know if any one of you believe that it is necessary in an artificial intelligence area, an authority that can regulate artificial intelligence and the data collectively. Olga, you can you can say. It would be ideal. Uh, the the thing is that the governments are organized in the certain ways and they function like that for a long time and it would be interesting to find common grounds. The governments also have their silos as the academia do and the, the companies have so it would be interesting. I, I think what is missing today is that for example the regulator agencies of data they need to have this perspective of artificial intelligence. I think that this is something that we can work on, but it is still a process that we have to promote. We are totally involved in this regard, but we have to promote this, but I think it would be a good idea. But do you think that uh, a cooperation between regulators, do you think we are moving towards this direction? and uh, maybe a joint approach or something, if it's not a unique authority. But I think another point that is connected to that is how can we think, it is in Spanish, so how can we think in a digital ecosystems from the Latin American perspective and how to make sure the interest of the people from Global South is observed. So here also about regulation. The question is basically how to build an eco a digital ecosystem in Latin America and how to make sure and how we can promote the respect, the rights of the users in this ecosystem of Global South. Yes. Well, first I will assume that globalization at last universalized the technical equality or the equality as a legal conjuncture of people. So, and globalization did as never in the mankind. It made equal in many issues, and in terms of consumption, in terms of adaptation and habits and bad practices of daily lives of people. So, we have to uh, just continue to create prototypes in order to unfold in and develop in regions to create new inclusions and new participations of the citizens. For example, a young person from Mexico and from Kenya, they are the same. They have the same concerns. They have the same uh, entertainment, the same dangers. So what artificial intelligence also we have the same. So we have risks for everyone that are the same. So we have to set aside the concern to think that we have an exclusive and genuine work from Latin America. No, what we have are common problems with the world. We have bad governance, we have lack of investments as the, the problem of Rio de Janeiro and I like the previous August uh, uh, proposal that she mentioned. I think it was interesting. If in the world, in spite of the threats of war and the problems that we have and the expansion of a third world war, we hope that doesn't happen. But 
as it, it is cre it was created the international station the international space station would serve for that I think it would be very suggestive to generate a station, a digital station, an international digital station expert in artificial intelligence. That would be great because in the end of the day, all of us are the same. With the problems of bad habits or best practices, they serve everyone. Defending an agency of that size and using the intelligence that comes from the academia that is more neutral in terms of effective presumption that comes from civil society organizations and the activists who defend by genuine convictions the causes and human values so maybe they can handle that with of course the participation of agencies and companies that also would bear with the the expenses and the blames because this is how it works it is a paradox if you don't have this opportunity so they can take their blames and big companies that promote uh, addictions for example alcohol and cigarettes they can cooperate against cancer and diabetes and this would be a type of idea. So it's not an exclusive idea for Latin America. As if it is the Southeast Asia would had their own problems. I think globalization eradicated that, this kind of regional problems. So with these final words, I want to thank everyone, all the speakers, all the participants, the FGV staff and the CTS who made a wonderful work and I want to reaffirm that the publications of CPDP later on this year will be presented in an event totally dedicated we will have a broad spectrum of publications of high-level publications in Portuguese a few of them in Spanish and many of them in English presented in the two weeks of October we are going to organize a dedicated event to give more highlights to the authors because not all of them could participate today maybe this event will be online to make sure everyone is participating so once again I want to thank you for coming it was the first in-person uh, event it's clearly locked not the last every year we'll have here this event and you are all welcome next year in FGV thank you Now, Kaipirinha for everyone.